Stay free with Russell Brand. See it first on Rumble. Bjorn, you're famous for these things. You are uh, broadly regarded as left wing. You wrote that book, The Environmental uh, Skeptic. Skeptical. Yeah. And what I want to say is that your position on climate change is what's brought you to prominence and I believe garnered you a good deal of criticism in oh, some... God. Yeah, it has, yes. hasn't it? Yes. And this is, what I want, this is what I most want to understand. This is what I most want to understand. I believe your position is that you say that climate change is real, that climate change is man-made, but the efforts that are being suggested to amend it will not make a sufficient difference, and uh, there are other things that could be done that will be more meaningful. One of the questions that I have is I know that polluting the planet cannot be good on a spiritual level, and it seems that there's significant evidence to suggest that, you know, that man-made climate change is real. What I know... And what I understand is that global elites do not promote ideas which are harmful to their interests. I know that. And I know that industrialization and consumerism and the commodification of everything on the planet must be in numerous ways harmful. Why are they promoting this climate change idea and advocating for the solutions that they are, including things like ESG, if those things will not be effective. And what about the other side of the argument, um, energy giants who are clearly pollutants. I feel like of the, uh, you know, like there's maybe like of the biggest pollutants in the world, 70 of them are uh, corporations, you know. So what I want to unpick is where is the power in this argument? Mm. I recognise that the, you know, if something like the argument for climate change is being as promoted as broadly as it is and is supported by powerful interests, that means that they are somehow benefiting from it, likely financially, and that the ultimate solutions that will be suggested will inhibit and impede the motion, movement and freedom of ordinary people. But I don't quite understand how it is because it sort of seems to me like the sort of thing that typically yep. I would believe in because I do care yep. about the planet, I love the environment, I'd love to uh, impede the interests of the powerful, regulate, control their businesses and their polluting behaviours. So tell me how you've arrived at this position and tell me how powerful, in particular as a starting point, how do the powerful benefit from their current climate change yeah. rhetoric? Well, so if, if you look at uh, all those guys who went to Davos last year and, you know, go to listen to uh, uh, Greta Thunberg, uh, a lot of them arrive in their own private jets. So in, in some sense, what you what you can see is they're telling us well, we should cut down on all kinds of stuff, but of course they're not actually interested in cutting down on their private planning. Uh, you know, there's this fun, I, fun point of, of uh, Kerry, uh, John Kerry, uh, the uh, climate czar from uh, uh, Biden, uh, who went to Iceland to pick up his environmental award in private plane. And, you know, so it's, it's sort of like, yeah, that's not how you're going to solve this problem. So there is a real problem. It is a, a thing that we need to fix but currently, it's being suggested that we should fix it by buying, say, lots of solar, lots of wind. Most of this is subsidized, and obviously, a lot of people are making a lot of money off of it. But the problem is, it cuts very little at fairly high cost. So actually, what we're doing is, we're doing a tiny bit of fixing climate change. So if you actually look at the whole Paris Agreement, for instance, it will solve about 1% of all the stuff that we're talking about trying to solve. So it'll cut a very, very minimal part of what we're trying to solve. Yet, it is going to be fantastically costly. You know, we're talking several trillion dollars. And of course, it's not going to be mainly the guys flying to Davos so it will pay. It'll be you and me and everybody else. And so what I'm trying to say is, look, you're never going to solve this problem partly by making poor solutions, that is, expensive solutions that will fix very little, but also, you're not going to do this by telling people you have to pay an insane amount of money. So one study in Nature magazine showed that the average American by mid-century, if we actually tried to do uh, the, uh, the Biden plan of cutting all uh, uh, emissions to net zero by 2050, would cost in the order of $11,000 per person per year. So That's you're just saying not happen. that what they're doing is they're manipulating this situation so that the solutions for uh, 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 ultimately affect ordinary people financially negatively. I, I tend to believe that they're not being that sh that they're not being that uh, cynical. I, I think more it's it's the easy way to solve this problem. See, we're doing something. We're putting up solar panels. We're putting up wind turbines. It feels like we're doing something, but the reality, of course, is emissions keep going up. And why? partly because these only do tiny bit in rich countries. And of course, poor countries have very, very different issues. You know, if you look at India and Indonesia and many other places, 
fundamentally, they want to get their population out of poverty. How do we get out of poverty? I mean, Britain is a great example. You got by burning coal for 200 years. Let's hope that the developing world won't have to do the same thing. But I understand that they are sort of making the same priority and saying, look, we'd actually like to get out of poverty first. I see that that's why they think that, that people regard globalism as an issue and a globalism as a solution, because it would appear that you would not be able to create a, a homogenized solution without accordance across nations, that all of those narratives would have to collapse. You'd have to say China, India, nations that haven't benefited from a couple of hundred years of fossil fuel burning industry. You're going to have to get up to speed because ultimately this is one planet. Can I ask you this? If we had a hundred percent solar energy and a hundred, or you know, fifty-fifty yeah. wind and solar, would that not solve the fossil fuel issue? So it would solve surprisingly less Why? than I think how, what how you think. So, so, first of all, uh, electricity is only about a fifth of all energy use. Uh -huh. So you have this idea, and and it's it's a very typical thing when you live in a in a you know in a in a house where you, all the stuff that you have is powered electricity. by electricity. Uh, but actually, your heating here is probably not electricity. It's gas. What is it? Wood? I don't know. But um, it's probably not electricity. I like to burn fur coats. <laughs> I go right, out yeah, and I, I yeah. shoot or animals. And yeah. then I burn and kittens. I burn <laughs> no, them. Yes. Yeah. Um, but, right. So, yeah, no, of course. I think it's but, probably oil. Uh, it might be oil. It might actually be oil. Area. Yeah, yeah. And, and, of course, most industrialized processes, uh, most heating, a lot of cooling, and 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 this is crucial, all the stuff that actually underpins civilization, so fertilizer, mm -hmm. uh, half the world's population is dependent on fertilizer that's produced with gas, uh, steel, uh, and cement. These things, we don't have any good way of doing with electricity. So now, I see. Again, we could eventually get there, mm -hmm. but we're not anywhere close. And the second part, sorry, just very Please. briefly, is even if you had solar and wind 100%, what happens on days when the sun is not shining and the wind is not blowing? Well, which, you're not uh, storing it. Well, see, that's the other problem. It's incredibly costly to store it for a very long time. Right costly. Now, yes, costly. Right now, the world has batteries enough to store enough electricity for one minute and 15 seconds. By the end of this decade, we'll have to 11 minutes. Remember, Germany routinely... 11 every, minutes. 11 minutes. Germany routinely every year they have what they call Dunkelflaude. They they both have yeah. How every, typical of every, the Everything sounds funny it's when you say Dunkelflaude. Now there you go. what happens in Dunkelflaude? <laughs> when the sun is really not shining very much and there's no wind for five days. That's seven thousand minutes. So you have you know batteries for five eleven minutes or mm. what? And then you need electricity for 7,000 minutes. Right, but let me That's keep going. You've got a lot of information, remember, and I'm just trying to praise yeah. it and understand it as you're going along. Electricity, and because I'm sort of Western and live in comfort and luxury, I feel like, oh, electricity, that's, that's the everything. issue. But yeah. that's only one fifth of the issue. Yes. You, you've highlighted uh, cement, power generation in other areas. No, not power generation, but, uh, but, uh, uh, but uh, uh, sorry, industrial processes and, uh, uh, and uh, 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 heating. As, and the, as and the impossibility yes. yep. and the impossibility of storing yep. electricity, even if you were able to generate that. But so quite quickly, it seems Bjorn, we arrive at the point that in order to solve these problems, if, we, if that truly were the intention, we would have to radically reevaluate our entire economic models. Cause you'd quickly have to say, well, the cost and value of batteries is only built upon our current understanding of supply, demand, economics, manufacture. If we had a truly globalist product, uh, project, you'd say, we're making those fucking batteries because we're solving that problem because this is what, yeah. how we have to resolve it. And yeah, yeah. we're going to flatten out and regulate all cost, right? You'd have to... So there is no... What you're, what you're essentially saying is that what's being highlighted by the current climate change movement are sort of problems that are... Problems that are manageable that don't main it make a meaningful difference, like the current capacity yeah. for solar and wind being an example of something that isn't going to significantly move the needle. Yes. And in and order to significantly move the needle, you would have to radically interrupt the uh, ascent of certain powerful interests. Or, or and, and I think that you're absolutely right. It would be if, if we tried to go net zero, remember, society can do pretty much anything they want. It's just going to be 
very, very uncomfortable to do some things, right? We could certainly go net zero, but you know, imagine your life without your phone, without this lighting, without the heating, without all the other stuff, you know, and without you know, food for four billion people. There's a lot of unpleasantness built into that uh, uh, setup, which is why it's not going to happen. And so, yes, we are currently just merely uh, suggesting sort of you know very tiny solutions. They're not tiny in the sense that they're not costly, but they won't solve very much. My point has been, and I think this, this uh, so I, I work together with uh, more than 50 of the world's top climate economists and seven, uh, three Nobel laureates on finding out where can you actually do the most good for climate. What they said was, this is all about innovation. And let, let me just tell you a story before I tell you uh, this thing, but if uh, you may have heard about this, back in the 1860s, uh, whales, we hunted whales, we almost hunted whales to extinction uh, because whales provide this incredibly bright and clean burning uh, mm. fuel. So basically, it lit up most of Western Europe and North America. And you know, you could tell, and you know, if there had been green pieces and Fridays for the future, they would have gone back and said, you know, you've got to change this out and live with slightly dimmer lighting and more polluting lighting, but hey, go back and you know, save the whales. And of course, people weren't actually willing to do that. What did happen was we found oil. So we found an alternative, and then suddenly that oil burnt cleaner, brighter, it was cheaper, you don't have to go out in the middle of the ocean and kill whales. And that was basically what saved the whales. It was an innovation rather than trying to tell everyone, you got to stop doing all that stuff you do, which is bad. It doesn't work very well in telling people, I'm sorry, could you be a little colder, a little poorer, a little less content? That's not going to work. But what will work is innovation. That's happened a lot of times. One yeah. thing I will outright reject there, Bjorn, is the idea that political power lies with ordinary people. That it's, we the people refuse to stop using whale blubber until there is a better and greater innovation. It was profitable for yeah. the whaling industry, yeah. then it became profitable for the oil industry. Yeah. And also what this points to for me is that we have no ethical substrata to call upon. No one is willing, No, there is no recourse for, if we are a, a species that has a shared responsibility to one another and the planet to improve or alter our conditions. No one has the resources mentally, spiritually anymore to do that. That ultimately all that we've been coached, trained, conditioned to a point where ultimately everybody will just do what's best for them. Individualism, materialism, yeah. rationalism, atheism, nihilism. No one has any faith in anything. No one has any belief in it. That there is no pre prevailing ideology that people say, well, this is what I care about. This is what I love. I will sacrifice. I will kill, die for, for these set of beliefs. No? I, I tend to be a little more optimistic than that. I'm optimistic. I, 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 get, I get your point. I think there's a lot of people who would you know, prefer to just watch TV than you know, take hard choices. Uh, I'm not blaming on the, people. On I'm the saying, other, no, no. Uh... But on the other hand, I think there's a lot of people out there who are actually every day. You probably had quite a few on your show. You know, people that I meet every once in a while. Certainly, a lot of the climate warriors. You know, the Friday for Future and many others. Are, they actually want to do something. You know, Greta Thunberg. I have strong disagreements with her, but I think you know she's actually said. You know, I don't want to uh, 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 go by airplane, so I'm, you know, I'm going to go through all this extra trouble to showcase that I actually care about the planet. I think a lot of people want to do at least a modic modi moderate, sorry, moderate uh, part of. I should just say I'm Danish, so yeah, you're Danish. English, English is not my first language, uh, but um, so a moderate amount of, I know, of score? damage. School. Uh, Carlsberg. <laughs> Carlsberg, of course, yes. Preben, Elkiar, Michael Laudrop. Okay, okay, there all you of go. The Brian Laudrop. Hey, so you speak Danish. <laughs> anyway, so. Modicum so, might have been what you were looking for. Yes, that for. was probably what it was. So I, th I think people are willing to do some, but I think we just have to realize the current way we're trying to solve climate change, we're essentially saying, let's go far beyond what people are willing to do. That's just not going to happen. And of course, let's try to convince. The Africans, you know, development, that's not really for you. Of course, they're not going to accept that, right? They want to get their people out of poverty.